start recording. So as a reminder, on this nine weeks test, you will be allowed eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, front and back, handwritten, handwritten, whatever you want. You can have your mommy write you a nice cheerful note on there if you like, except of course it has to be in your handwriting, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. But you can write whatever you want. If you just can't get those polyatomic ions memorized, you can take up your eight and a half by 11 space with polyatomic ions. Um, if you don't like the official, if you don't remember all the names of the elements, you could write all the elements and all their names, okay? I don't care what you put on that, that's up to you. But when we come in to take the test uh, next Tuesday, right? Yes. Front and the back, eight and a half by eleven, front and back. And you can use you can use lined paper like this, which is actually a little smaller, or you can use white copy paper. So whichever you want, it does have to be handwritten, though. That's where tiny handwriting comes in handy, definitely. What? You can use grid paper. It just you get eight and a half by eleven inches. Let's let's be clear. This is inches. We are going to use that term, okay? So front and half. <laughs> really small. Yeah, but whatever you if you want, I might you might rec, uh, do some example problems. I don't care. Whatever whatever you want to put on that paper, that's up to you, okay? So if if you found a homework problem that you thought was challenging, or maybe that octane problem that you thought was a little extra challenging to remind yourself to double if you need to. That's on you. Whatever you want to write down. All right, everybody good on that. Let's talk now again about single replacement reactions. Make sure this is... Yeah, okay. Um, so single replacement is a reaction in which an element reacts with a compound to form another one, uh, another element and another compound. So. Again, the key here, and I used this analogy with y'all last time, the key here is somebody shows up alone. Somebody shows up single. Somebody else, somebody different, goes home single. Right? You got the guy that shows up to the dance alone and then butts in. This guy goes home alone. And how we tell that, how we, how we figure out um, who goes home alone and who goes home with the girl is by using the activity series. So that's why I ask you all to have that out on your desk. So we talked about these examples. I want you to look at the activity series and tell me. I'm looking at this. This is iron. So iron shows up to the dance, notices that copper and nitrate are dancing together. Okay. Then I want you to look at your activity series, that series, and where do you see iron? Iron is above copper. Iron is above copper. That means iron is cuter than copper. And so nitrate kicks copper to the curb. Copper goes home alone and starts dancing with iron. Okay? That's what goes on here. What's going on is iron is more active, has a higher activity, and I'm not going to get into how they calculate that with y'all. Um, just, you're going to have the list anytime you need it. You're going to have the list in front of you, okay? You're going to have the activity series. And all you want to say is, is the guy that showed up higher on the list than the guy who's already dancing? Okay? Make sense? All you're looking for is, is the guy who showed up single higher than this one on the activity series. And this is the non-metals, right? So in this case, fluorine, and you can look at the other chart, although again, it's on the periodic table, it's the same thing. Fluorine is cuter than bromine. So potassium's gonna kick bromine to the curb, bromine's gonna go home alone, potassium and fluoride are gonna leave together. Okay, that's the way this is gonna work. And this is what we just said. Here's our activity series. So, lithium, very active. None of y'all have necklaces made out of lithium. Okay? Because lithium likes to react. Lithium will replace other metals easily. It doesn't, it's not going to last very long. 
On the other hand, we go down here. So lithium is your, is your Tom Holland, the super cutest boy, whatever it is. And then the, there's the little various cutest boys, maybe the, uh, some football team players over here, right? And you keep going down until you get to that, that smelly, nasty eighth grade boy that doesn't know how to shower, right? Nobody wants to dance with, okay? That's gold. Now, in chemistry, we like gold. We like platinum, silver, mercury. We like those things in chemistry because they don't react. And so this is why gold has value for us as a society. It's because gold isn't reacting with things. Gold doesn't tarnish very easily, right? I can have a gold conductor. Some of y'all may have electronics that have gold conductors or gold-plated things. So you take your copper, you put a little bit of gold on top of the copper, and that keeps the, uh, the, the reactions down so they have a, a better connectivity, okay? So same thing over here on the nonmetals, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Like I said, it just runs down the periodic table. Yes, sir. A nonmetal is not going to replace a metal with that exception, hydrogen. And remember we told you hydrogen is this oddball, sits on top of the metals. Of course, it's a nonmetal, but it can act like a metal a lot of times, and this is one of those cases. So it's important to recognize that hydrogen will replace these guys, but won't replace these guys. So where might you see hydrogen? What kind of comp uh, compounds have we studied that start with H? Acids. Acids. Acids start with H, and they break up, okay? And they can replace some of these things. All right, take a look at that. Single replacement reactions. So why do reactions not go in reverse? Well, because it's not like the eighth grade boy who feels bad. Exactly. You aren't going to give up Tom Holland for an eighth grade boy. Exactly. You're just not. You're just not. You're just not, you know. What's that? <laughs> could be. Could be. All right. So halogens are only going to replace halogens, or nonmetals are going to replace nonmetals, right? So chlorine can replace bromine and iodine, but not fluorine. All right. So metals undergo replacement based on their activity. I want you guys to predict this. First of all, the best thing, I'm going to do the first one with you. Uh, Y'all are going to need to do some side-by-side -side here. But uh, uh, who showed up alone? Iron, Iron showed up alone. Next thing you need to do is look over here. Who is iron trying to replace? Magnesium. magnesium. All right. So I'm going to have iron. Iron showed up alone. He's trying to replace magnesium. Which one of those two is cuter? Magnesium. Magnesium's cuter, right? Magnesium's higher on the activity series. So this is where we would say there is no reaction. Okay. Iron's going to come up and say, hey, can I dance with sulfate? And sulfate's like, uh, no. I'm sticking with magnesium. So there is no reaction there. Nothing happened. The chemistry that happened beforehand was iron was all alone. Magnesium and sulfate were together. And at the end of it, iron still alone. Magnesium and sulfate are together. There was no reaction. Nothing happened there. Y'all follow? Y'all go ahead and do the next two. Figure out who's showing up alone. And then figure out who it's trying to replace. It, that's often helpful. Uh, you, you don't have to, but it's definitely it's definitely often helpful. And you can just write NR if there's no reaction. Let's take a look at this one. Who showed up alone? Iron. iron. So iron's going to try and replace what? Copper. copper. Iron, copper. What's going to happen? Copper. Who's going home alone? Copper. Copper's going home alone, so I'm going to go ahead and write the copper. All right, and now iron. Iron sulfate, right?
That's the reaction that happens. And I know that because I'm using the activity series. then you use the one you were given. So on this case, who showed up alone? What's that question? Uh, okay, so in this, this is a, that's a good point. I thought about talking to you about it, but since you brought it up. So in this case, copper is going to have a charge of what? You do know, because it's with sulfate, right? So this copper is going to have a plus two. Um, I'm going to tell you they're going to they're maintain charges, and so this is one of those that you don't actually know. But generally speaking, you're going to just maintain the same charge. So when we flip these, um, this is going to also end up having a, a plus two. And this one, what charge is this one going to have? What charge are you going to have? I've indicated the charge. What charge is it going to have? So the charge is going to be zero. What charge is this going to have? Zero. So because you brought it up, this is actually a redox. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit, a little bit more in deep. But this is a reaction. In fact, all single replacement reactions are redox reactions. These guys actually change their charges because electrons are moving. The electrons actually, two electrons leave iron and go on to copper. Okay, don't stress about that right now. On this one, who showed up alone? Bromine. bromine. And who's bromine trying to replace? Chlorine. Chlorine. What happens? No chance, man. No reaction, because chlorine is higher. So potassium's already dancing with the cutest boy she can find. Okay. Now, what happens if fluorine decides to show up? Chlorine goes to the curb. Let's not, let's, not let's not be too bad. Let's just go to the curb. Let's not go to the bucket, okay? So. Right, right. We just yet. Now, see this one, this is the different, uh, different situation, right? So this one had a, I, I said iron had a plus two. This one said iron had a plus three. But you're not going to know that. All right. Let's now take a look at double, double replacement. So double replacement is a situation where the metals trade places or the nonmetals. I don't care. Basically, what's going on in this kit situation is these two couples go to the dance and then they switch partners. Okay? Now, what really happens is both couples break up and one forms a couple and goes home. Now, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit deeper later um, because really you only care about the one couple that actually makes some chemistry happen. Okay? That's what we're going to care about, but, but I'll explain that in a moment. But I want you to understand, in a general form, in a generic form, the metals are going to switch places. And you've got to keep track of it. Because remember, we're always going to write a metal first. So it's going to be a metal and a non-metal, plus another metal and non-metal. And just swap the metals. Now, you may notice, when I do it, sometimes I swap the non-metals doesn't matter as long as you're not trying to swap a non-metal in one for a metal in the other. All your rules of chemistry still apply. So here we go. Uh, we're going to begin with two compounds and we're going to end with two different compounds. That's, that's how this is going to work. Are we okay with that? All right. Here is some examples. So I had sodium fluoride and potassium bromide, and if I have a successful double replacement, I'm going to have potassium fluoride and sodium bromide. Everybody see that? All we did is switch the metals. So these two guys swapped. Good. This one I have barium nitrate and sodium sulfate. 
and this forms sodium nitrate and barium sulfate. Y'all following along? Okay. Predict the products. So we're going to assume this actually happens. So I need you all to write the chemical equation. Write the chemical equation and then finish it. Yes. Well, it's not, it's just a skeleton. It's not a balanced equation. You would, you would have to balance it. You'd, you'd put a two in front of that. And have okay. If you don't know your polyatomics at this point, you got to get those down. If you don't know your diatomics, oh my goodness, you got to do what it takes. Brinkelhoff, it's not hard. Okay, let's go ahead and write our equation here. Iron 2 nitrate. So symbol for iron is Fe. And the charge for this one is, and how do I know that? Formula for nitrate is NO3, negative 1. I crisscross that and I get what? Fe, NO3, 2. Okay, reacts with potassium oxide. The symbol for potassium is K. Keep forgetting this. And that's plus one, and oxide is O, and the minus two, right? And I crisscross those, and I get what? All right, fantastic. So I just told you that actually reacts, right? So let's go ahead and see what happens in this case. Um, I'm going to switch the metals. So when potassium and uh, nitrate get together, they form what? KNO3. KNO3. They form potassium nitrate, and they form KNO3. All right, let me go see if I can't find another one. So potassium nitrate, that's KNO3, and it's going to form what? Iron oxide. Iron oxide. And in this case, whenever we do our double replacements, I'm not changing the oxidation state. And so I know my iron over there is going to be the same iron as over here. And so it's going to be iron 2. Okay? So I'm going to have Fe plus 2 and O minus two, so iron oxide, or iron two oxide is going to be what? FeO. FeO, fantastic. All right, there we go. Much What's that? This is not a redox. And I know that because there's no charges changing. Everybody who, on this side, their charges were the same, their oxidation states were the same as they are over here. We're just switching them, okay? Um, let's take a look here. Uh, and is that balanced? No. How can I balance that? All right. There you go. Everybody good with that? This is the kind of stuff I'm going to ask you to do on the test is convert these words. So y'all see where no one had a name ionic compound, super important. And then I'm just, we're just switching the metals. Uh, and for this test, uh, I think we're pretty much going to tell you if they react or don't, although it's very important to know that sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. 
There we go. Oops, whoops, whoops. There we go. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. Just like with single replacement reactions, double replacement reactions don't always happen. So I want you to imagine, generally speaking, what happens, right? You go to a dance, and the boy and the girl, and they walk in, and they're all holding hands, right? And everything's kind of cute, and they're all holding hands. And then they get in the dance, and a lot of times they go to the dance, and they separate, right? They go talk to their friends. The guys go talk to their friends, and the girls go talk to their friends, and they talk about their pretty dresses, and the guys are like, oh, yeah, huh, right? And... And that's what they do. And then it comes time to dance, and they may get back together and dance again. So this is what happens whenever you put most salts in water. So I have a little beaker here, a little beaker. OK, I got some water. And I put a salt in there. Doesn't really matter what kind of salt. Um, let's just call it, uh, we'll do uh, sodium and chloride for, for fun's sake. Uh, I'm going to have little sodium ions floating around little chloride ions floating around. As soon as you put them in water, that's what happens. They dissociate, right? They break up. And then I've got another beaker. And maybe that is, um, and maybe that is um, uh, iron, iron two nitrate. We just did that one. Okay. And so over here, I've got little FEs floating around and some nitrates, okay? And everybody's happy. These guys are happy and these guys are happy, right? They're all separated. They're floating around. Then I mix them together. I mix them together in one, one big bucket. Not a very pretty beaker, but that's what it is. And instead of being like this, there's two options. So one option is that everybody just stays separate. That there is no chemical reaction. There's no chemistry happening. Everybody just stays separate. And that there's Na plus and Cl minus and Fe plus 2 and some NO3s. Okay. And everybody just is still separate. Well, from a chemical perspective, there's nothing different between this guy plus this guy and these two guys mixed together. What I care about is, is there some chemistry in that when I get done, is there something different than what we started with? That is my definition of a reaction, right? Something's different than what we started with. So what we do is we decide who is soluble. Who's going to get together with enough force, enough strength, that they're going to overcome water? So water's trying to tear these things apart. This is why water breaks up sodium and chloride, because sodium has a charge of what? Plus one, and chloride has a charge of negative one. That makes it, that makes it a, a, a strong attraction all by itself, but when you start putting a bunch of water molecules in it, the positive sides of the water molecules are tearing at the chlorine, and the negative sides of the water molecules are tearing at the sodium. Okay, So when a whole bunch of water molecules surround each of these, they can keep them apart. So how do I figure out if a double replacement reaction actually happens? Well, we use this thing. Uh, I'm going to skip that. We'll come back to it. We use this thing called solubility rules. And when we get done, I'm going to go back to solubility rules. There we go. If, if a compound is soluble, if a compound is soluble, we're going to say that there's no reaction. Because they started out in solution surrounded by water, right? And they ended up in solution surrounded by water. There's no change there. If, however, the compound that formed is insoluble, that means not soluble, 
we're going to say a reaction happened. These two were so attracted to each other that all those water molecules could not pull them apart. All right. So who is soluble? Well, my group one metals and the ammonium ion. There's more solubility rules than this, but if you break it down to these, you just really have to memorize these four and you're in good shape. Thank you. All right. Group one, my plus ones. Alkali metals have a charge of what? Plus one, and the ammonium ion has a charge of plus one. So my plus ones. Yeah, they're attracted, but that negative two from the oxygen and the water, stronger, pulls them away from whoever they're trying to be attracted to. Okay? Soluble, nitrates, acetates, chlorates, and cyanides. What's the charge that these guys all have? These are all minus one. So these are all plus one. These are all minus one. I'm hoping you're starting to see a trend here. Um, binary compounds of uh, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Fluorine is a crazy exception, so don't count that one. But chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Again, the charge of chloride, bromide, and iodide is minus one. There is a couple of important exceptions, uh, and I'm not going to get into the why. Um, when chlorine or bromine or iodine bonds with silver, mercury, or lead, those are insoluble. Silver, mercury, and lead, but everything else is soluble. Y'all good? Okay. Insoluble are carbonates. What's my charge for carbonate? Minus two. Phosphates. What's my charge for phosphates? Minus three. Chromates. Minus two. Dichromates. Minus two. Okay. Most, I'm going to give you some other rules, most sulfates are soluble. So this is a general trend to kind of help you think about what's going on. However, most, most sulfates are soluble. Most sulfides are not. And I, I don't know if y'all have the complete solubility rules or more complete ones. But y'all have these in your notes, right? You have this, this little chart. Okay. I'm going to go back a little bit and talk about, now that you understand solubility rules. So here's the thing. If I put um, silver chloride, so AgCl, and I try to put that in water, it's going to be solid, right? I try to put, some, I have some silver chloride and I put it in water and I stir it up, it just drops to the bottom. It just falls down. They have such an attraction for each other, water's not going to break them up. It just falls to the bottom. All right. So let's go over a possible example that uses that. Blank that for a minute. This is one we actually do, we may do later on. I'm going to take sodium chloride. Okay. Now, is sodium chloride soluble? Yes. Y'all need to write this down on a separate piece of paper somewhere. Separate. Or if you've got some white space on, on one of your pages there, stick it there. That's fine. So, is sodium chloride soluble? Yes. By what rule? Yes. Yeah, and so sodium, but sodium's, uh, we call sodium a, it's an alkali metal. If it's soluble, here's the term we use. We use aqueous. Remember that aqueous term? Yeah. Aqueous. And what this looks like is when I put this in a liquid, and I put this in water, it breaks up into that. The water molecules, and if I zoomed in on that, the water molecules themselves, this is Na, Okay, it's my little Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse water molecules. Y'all 
Y'all get that? The negative oxygens, a little plus sign here so you understand that the negative oxygens are attracting and wrapping around the sodium. Because the sodium's got a what charge? And opposites do what? Attract. On over here, the chlorine is doing the same thing. I've got chlorine. It's negative. However, what part of the water molecule is going to be attracted to it? The hydrogens. A little hydrogen here. It'll, it's not quite a... Let's make you a little Mickey Mouse here. Okay. And there's more of those. Okay. All right, y'all see that? The hydrogens are lining up to, to block the chlorine. When I put this in water, as soon as I take that table salt and I sprinkle it in water, this is what's going on. The water molecules are coming in and tearing those guys apart. All right. That takes care of the silver chloride or the, uh, the sodium chloride. So because of that, because it's soluble, I use the term aqueous. Remember I told you the other day you weren't going to be immediately required to know how to use aqueous or not? Congratulations, you've now graduated. Okay, now that you know the solubility rules, you should know whether or not that's going to be aqueous or solid. If it's soluble, it's aqueous. If it's insoluble, it's solid. So let's test this. Uh, I'm going to use silver nitrate. What's the formula for silver nitrate? Now, AgNO3, is that soluble? Look up the rules. Anybody anybody that has nitrate is soluble okay because the rules are basically in order right so if rule number one is true it's soluble if rule number two is true it's soluble y'all get me this has nitrate this is soluble so I'm going to write aqueous here too and again I'm not going to draw the little water molecules this is Ag plus, and then NO3 minus, and they're all floating around separate now. Because it's aqueous, this is what the ionic compounds do that are aqueous. Now, I want to go ahead and switch the metals, right? Because that's what we're going to do. So that means that instead of Sodium chloride, I'm going to write silver chloride, so this is AgCl plus NaNO3. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Next question is, which one of those is soluble and which one of those is insoluble? Silver chloride is insoluble, so if it's insoluble, I'm going to say it's a solid. And sodium nitrate is sol soluble, so it's going to be aqueous. And what I end up with here in this situation is this. I still have little Na's floating around, and I have nitrates floating around. But at the bottom down here, I have this kind of uh, ugly white colored stuff that is silver chloride and it's AgCl. Let me uh, and that's what's here. Yes. Yeah, you'd want to balance. In this case, this was already just happened to already be balanced but yeah so this is a reaction that happens you say yes this happens um, these two couples went to the dance they separated oh but look silver and chloride got together and they left the dance together this was a chemical reaction this is a reaction that actually happens 
And I know it happens because at the end of the day, I created something new. Okay? Any questions on double replacement? You just have to use the solubility rules to figure out if something happens. All right. I'm going to go back and we're going to hit those rest of those notes. All right, there we go. Remember, we're going to talk about evidences of color change. Sometimes when you do these things, you'll see a yellow color or a brown color. Uh, you could have production of gas, heating up or cooling down, okay? These are our evidences of uh, chemical reactions. All right, so I just went through this. I just want to make sure that you guys can fill in your notes. Um, okay, I don't know if there's notes you need to fill in there. What you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and switch the metals, rewrite the equation, and then ask if either of those turns out to be solids. Right, if, if they're both soluble, then nothing happened. Make sense? There was no chemistry. Nothing actually happened at the end of the day. Uh, if one of them is solid uh, and the other one, if e either of them is solid, then a reaction happened. All right. So here's our solubility rules we just talked about. Practice. I described a reaction very similar to this one. Did you all see this one? Yeah, is this one in your notes? What's that? Draw that in your notes. Just like that. Make the little beakers, make them all pretty. The little irons in there. someone else's trash. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, everybody done drawing? So I really want you all to be able to visualize what's going on here. That's good. Got your drawing done. Cool. 
All right, let's keep moving. Let's go through this. We're going to do this first one together. So what's the name of this compound? Go ahead and write the name on top. Do I need a Roman numeral for zinc? Why not? It's in the staircase, and zinc always has what charge? Plus two. How about this guy? This one messes some of y'all up on these tests. What's that one? Strontium chloride. Does it need a Roman numeral? No. Why not? Alkaline earth metal always has a charge of plus two. Fantastic. All right. First thing I want to do, uh, I'm going to look at these. Sulfates are mostly soluble. This is soluble. Chlorides are mostly soluble except for the silver lead and mercury exception, right? So I know both of these are aqueous, but that's really not what we're checking. We need to check the results. I'm going to swap the metals, and so I'm going to have strontium, which always has a charge of what? Plus two, and so strontium sulfate, right? Plus zinc chloride. Strontium sulfate plus zinc chloride. Figure out which one of those is soluble and write aqueous if they're both soluble. And if neither of them are soluble or one of them's insoluble, you're going to write solid. So, what's my rules? So yeah, you can use your solubility rules. I don't expect you to have them memorized already. Well, y'all are my favorite and smartest fourth period class this year, so. Strontium sulfate, soluble? So what would I write here? Aqueous. What about this guy? Is this soluble? So anything happen here? No. So I'm just going to write a big NR. No reaction. Y'all good with that? Everybody fine with that one? Do the next one. There's kind of a problem with the next one, and I keep fixing it every year. All right, so we we changed this to potassium carbonate for fun. So aluminum iodide's formula is Al what? I3. And if we're going to use potassium carbonate, potassium carbonate is K2CO3, right? And that's going to make, I'm going to switch the metals. So this is going to make aluminum carbonate. And potassium iodide. Potassium iodide. OK. So aluminum carbonate. Al, what's the charge of that? Plus 3. Plus three. Carbonate is CO3. What's its charge? 
minus 2. And so I crisscross those and I get what? Al2, CO3, 2. And potassium iodide. What's the formula for potassium iodide? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CO3, 3. Good catch. Good catch. There you go. Good? All right. Potassium iodide's formula is? KI. Cool. Deal. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Let's evaluate now. Uh, aluminum iodide. Is that going to be soluble? Okay, by what rule? Yeah, the, 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 right. So this is a binary compound. There's only two things. And it's not one of the three exceptions, silver, mercury, and lead, right? So I'm going to go ahead and put aqueous here. Uh, potassium carbonate. Soluble? Potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate is soluble, right? It's soluble by what rule? We'll run. Uh, potassium is a alkali metal. It has what kind of charge? Yeah. Cool. I just want y'all thinking about it. Aluminum carbonate. It's going to be soluble or not? Why not? The carbonates are insoluble unless they're worth one of those plus ones. Because all ammonium and alkali metals are going to be soluble. All right, so this is going to be a solid. And potassium iodide. That's going to be soluble, so we're going to write what? AQ aqueous. That soluble again means I throw it in water, it's going to break apart. All right, barium bromide and sulfuric acid. You guys go ahead and do this one. Okay, let's take a look. Barium bromide. Barium symbol is. And what's barium's charge? How do I know that? Plus two. Group two, alkaline earth metal, fantastic. Bromide is Br, and what's its charge? Minus one. So when I crisscross these, I get what? Ba, Br2. Let's go ahead and just for fun, we're going to look at our solubility rules. Is this going to be soluble? Yes. By what rule? It's a binary compound with bromine, so definitely that's going to be aqueous. Okay? Sulfuric acid. Ooh, this is an acid. If it's an acid and it's named an acid, I know it has to start with what? Hydrogen. hydrogen. So I'm going to go ahead and write the hydrogen over here. I'm going to have an H and a plus. Now, sulfuric, is there a hydro in front of that? Not a hydro. That means it's going to be a polyatomic ion or an oxy anion, right? Yes. Okay. So, sulfuric should turn into what? Eight. Sulfate. So, I'm going to go ahead and actually write sulfate. And we all know the formula for sulfate is SO4. And the charge for sulfate is negative 2. And just like we've done with all of our other ionic compounds, we're going to do what now? I'm going to crisscross. Take that 1 over here. Take that 2. Bring it over here. And so sulfuric acid is H2SO4. And again, I'm going to look that up in my solubility rules. This is probably pretty obvious since it's an acid, but we're going to look it up in solubility rules anyway. Is this going to be aqueous or, or uh, solid? Be aqueous. It is definitely soluble, so it's aqueous. All right. And remember, I'm, I'm working this problem. Just, okay, I just don't feel like bending over, so. Next, let's switch the metals. 
and the hydrogen. And so I'm going to have hydrogen hydrogen bromide or hydrobromic acid. And I wrote hydrogen bromide so that we could see the switch, but hydrobromic acid. Okay, so the formula for hydrobromic acid or hydrogen bromide is HBr. And I'm going to skip this question because I'm already going to tell you that. And then I'm going to have barium sulfate. Okay, and the formula for barium sulfate is BaSO4. Now, barium sulfate, if I look at my solubility rules, barium sulfate, soluble or not? It's not. It's one of my exceptions to sulfates. Is that not on, is that on your list? Oh, that's not good. We will have to get, we'll give you the solubility rules for this test. Um, here's my exceptions to sulfate. Barium, strontium, lead, calcium, silver, and mercury. So lead, silver, mercury. Makes sense. Because they're the same ones, right? And then barium plus two, strontium plus two, calcium plus two. And the idea here uh, is that the plus two and the minus two are sticking together. And water can't break them up. Yeah, okay, so silver, mercury, lead, those are the same ones for the, the other guys, okay? So AG, actually I'll write it here so the guys at home can see too. So silver, my, AG, mercury, HG, and PB, lead. Those are my normal, those are the ones that are also the exceptions for the binary uh, halogens. Okay, I also have, I'm just starting here, barium, strontium, and calcium. And again, these guys are my okay, insoluble with sulfate, barium, strontium, calcium. Again, conceptually, I want you all to think about that. It's, it's a good way to help you think about it. All six of these are insoluble with sulfate. Otherwise, sulfates uh, are soluble. Okay. Everybody fine? Good? All right. We'll have, we should have some time to practice this. All right. Now, we've talked about how to write these reactions, but when you go play a sport, uh, whether it's uh, football or band or basketball, the important stuff, the stuff I care about, is happening on the field of play or the court, right? Those are the participants. What's a word? What do we call the guys up in the stands? Uh, we call them spectators. As a player, I don't generally care about the spectators. And in chemistry, oftentimes we don't care about the spectators. And so we talk about, so we write this thing called a net ionic equation. And that lets us figure out who is actually playing the game. Where's the chemistry actually happening? So that we can ignore the spectators. If all you're here to do is show up and watch, I don't care about you. Okay? And that's what we're talking about here. So we're going to write an equation. Then we're going to break it up. And then we're going to figure out where the actual chemistry is happening. 
All right, so we're going to go through this one at a time. Aqueous lithium chloride is added to a solution of barium nitrate. All right, so I want you all to make a quick change here. If you have a pass and you have to go, go ahead and go and be sure and watch the video. I'm going to take about two minutes because I really want to finish this up. Lithium sulfate, you need to make a quick change. Change that to sulfate. Okay. Balanced equation, let's go ahead and write that. I'm going to do that for you. That's Li2SO4, and that's aqueous. Barium nitrate. Um, I'm actually going to move this. Li2SO4, aqueous. Barium nitrate is Ba. NO3, 2, that's also aqueous because of the nitrate. That's going to form barium sulfate solid plus aqueous. All right. Again, be sure and change on your notes this to sulfates to make sure you're, you're keeping up with that. What I'm going to do here with the total ionic equation is everywhere it's aqueous, I'm going to break it up into its constituent ions. And that helps me see the chemistry that might be going on. So I need to, I have two lithiums. I have a plus. And I'm not going to write all that, but two lithiums plus sulfate, two minus, plus barium plus two plus two nitrates okay each of those minus one yields plus y'all good All I did here is everywhere it was aqueous, I broke them up into their constituent ions. If it says aqueous, I'm going to break it up. That's why I got to figure out on both sides of the equation who's aqueous. So copy that down. good? Sleeper, you good? Got it copied? Right. Write down what I wrote down. Okay. If I'm writing an algebra problem, Right? And I say 2A, and I say that's a bad marker. Okay? And I say 2A plus 3C plus uh, 1D equals 2A plus 1C plus X. Is there something I could do to simplify that? Just like right away, you should be able to see it. What's yeah, I could totally get rid of this, right? Those are exactly the same. And then I could solve, I could get rid of this, and I can make this a 2C, right? Does that make sense? We're going to do a similar thing here. And that is, what we're going to say is, if nothing happened, and basically you showed up, Two lithium ions showed up single. Two lithium ions went home single. Nothing happened with lithium. From an algebra perspective, that's a chemistry perspective. From an algebra perspective, I got two lithiums here and two lithiums here. I can just simply cancel them. 
if they're exactly the same in the same state, lithium was over here surrounded by a bunch of water molecules. Over here, lithium's over here surrounded by a bunch of water molecules. Nothing's going on. Is sulfate, is sulfate the same here as it is over there? No, so I can't get rid of that one. What about barium? What about nitrate? Get rid of nitrate in the same way I can get rid of nitrate. So that is, this is my total ionic equation, the one I wrote before scratching stuff out. That leaves me, these are spectators. They didn't have anything to do with the chemistry. Okay? The net ionic equation is this. SO4 uh, minus 2. You can write aqueous if you want. You don't really need to. It's an ion. Yields BaSO4 solid. Don't split solids up. You only split aqueous up. That's my net ionic equation. This is what I care about. This is the chemistry that happened. All this stuff we poured together. This is the chemistry that happened. This is what I care about in terms of the net ionic equation. Everybody good? Okay, you guys do the next one. If everybody's ionic, you cancel everything out. If everything's ionic, everything's aqueous, you end up canceling everything out. Of course, there's no reaction. So there we go. You guys do this one. Take a minute and do this one. So start with the whole equation, get it balanced, then write the total ionic split everybody up that's aqueous, and then the net ionic after you cancel a, out. Make sure everybody understands this. You got the first part. Have we, have we gotten the equation written? Yeah. Okay, we got that far. All right, cool. Sodium carbonate. Symbol for sodium is charge is carbonate is charge is. I crisscross those two things. What do I get? All right, let's do that first. Na2CO3. Is that going to be aqueous? I would agree. Why? Why? It has sodium. Alkali metal plus one. We'll go ahead and put aqueous here. Now you see why this is important because we're going to do that next. Magnesium bromide. Symbol for magnesium is? Charge for that is? Bromide is, charge for that is, I crisscross those and I get what? Mg Br2. Now what is that? Is that aqueous? By what rule? The binary compound of bromine, so also going to be aqueous. Let's switch the metals. Switch the metals. That means I'm going to have magnesium carbonate. And I'm going to have sodium bromide. All right, magnesium carbonate and sodium bromide. Good. Magnesium symbol is charge. Carbonate is charge. I crisscross those and I get what? And that is soluble or not? Not soluble. By what rule? Carbonate. So I'm going to put a little S on this one. Plus sodium bromide. Sodium symbol is Bromide is, crisscross those and I get, now is that soluble? Yeah. So I'm going to put a little AQ on that. 
and that's soluble because of the bromide and the sodium. Here's the deal. The sodium is going to take precedence. It's always, anything with a sodium salt is going to be soluble. All right, cool. Is that balanced? Yes, yeah, so let's go over here. We're going to put a 2 here. Sodium bromide. Now is it balanced? Okay. Did everybody get to this point? So now I want you to tear apart everybody that's aqueous. Because that's what the water's doing. We're just going to break apart everybody that's aqueous. And I'm going to, instead of having Na2, remember, I'm going to pull that 2 up. I don't have Na2. I have two sodium ions. Okay? I can put aqueous on that. And I have one carbonate ion. All right, how many magnesium do I have? One, and what's its charge? And how many bromides do I have? And their charge is? All right, what do I do with the magnesium carbonate? I leave it. It's a solid. It does not break up in water. That's what the whole point of this conversation is. Okay, and on this side now I have two and A's, aqueous, and I have two bromides also aqueous. All right, hopefully everybody, has everybody got that written down? That's wrong, because these are these are bromide ions, okay? I'm not finding it naturally. It's not bromine gas. It's bromide ions. They've already acquired their extra electron, and so because of that, they're happy. That's sort of their partner, right? So they've acquired their eight. They have a negative one charge, so they're going to dissolve in, in water, okay? Okay, good. Everybody get this written down. Y'all follow? Okay. Now let's write the net ionic, and I'm going to do that by canceling out the sodium on this side, and the sodium on that side, and the bromide, and the bromide. And I'm going to copy down what's left. So that is CO. 3 minus 2 plus Mg aqueous yields MgCO3 solid. That's the net ionic equation. Oh, it is. Definitely, because it's chemistry. Does that make sense? Y'all follow? All right. So we're going to try and have you all finish the packets. It's going to be 9 through 13, right? And so we need to get ready for that test, the test that's coming up.